Okay, I decided to make this video because something remarkable happened, which is that my last Reddit post shoot up. Um, right now it already went down a bit, but it's still quite high. It's up. Ooh, where is it? There it is. It was at place four below the st sticky posts and I'm quite happy about that I think it's if not the most successful reddit post in the Jordan Peterson reddit um, it's the second one and I'm happy because I'm really trying to focus on philosophical content and as you can see most of the content that gets up to the top is about politics which i find sad since the core message of jordan peterson is a psychological slash philosophical one so i find it regrettable that so much energy and attention goes into the political stuff but anyway i'm happy that some people appreciated what i did here Let's look at it again. So this is a map that I tried to describe in my 20 minute video yesterday. Um, but here you have it visually. Um, it's about chapter number seven of the 12 rules for life book. Pursue what is meaningful, not what is expedient. Um, as you might know, I've been making a series about this book where I try to find out what are the truths that underlie the rules and <laughs> rule 7 was so complex that I, I took me way too much I decided to make a video, a blog post and so on only about that rule and this is the main product that came out of that effort it's this scheme here that you can see and I don't know what Jordan Peterson would say about this, right? It's my interpretation. It's my bird's eye perspective. And um, let's look at it again. Uh, my, this scheme is all about that there are like three fundamental problems. And to each of them, you can basically react with two fundamental attitudes. And mainly the two attitudes are about blaming the circumstances and bending your behavior based on that circumstance and kind of letting your behavior follow from that, you know, like you suffer and therefore you, I don't know, shy away from the suffering, you allow the suffering to define who you are and then in in the second case about evil that would be the temptation to go a step further and kind of destroy the very frame that generates the suffering which is the fact that you have values so to destroy values um, which can be done in different more and less permanent ways and then there is the last problem which is uh, the death of god so called which is when, um, a more historical kind of event I guess perhaps a more contingent event um, but still uh, it's the problem that since we now think way more um, strictly and rationally and arguably it's a good thing we have trouble actually believing in something like God and but there too you can react to this and either become a nihilist um, or try to kind of ground your actions in the world on some kind of fully rational and fully defined totalizing worldview which has its own problems mainly that it is um, dehumanizing because it um, it excludes everything that does <coughs> that doesn't fit and um, with each of these problems there is another attitude which um, basically consists in doing the right thing anyway. 
basically it's that if you can kind of decide who you are at the core um, and act based on that despite or in spite of all the bad circumstances the suffering that you will have to f um, confront the the fact that you have values and that there are people who are acting against these values all of that should never be an excuse to let uh, your character be bent i guess this is all um the 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 core of this idea of pursue what is meaningful not what is expedient is to kind of let who you are or your aim determine your actions and only then your thoughts inform your actions and um and and this is what i try to describe in uh, as grounding your life in meaning because meaning is not something rational it's an instinct that you can follow um, it's when you act in the world and something comes up that doesn't fit and that's your sense of meaning telling you look there is something missing and you can either ignore it because it doesn't fit your worldview or you can pay attention to it and it doesn't mean that this thing or this voice or this contradiction is right but you need to negotiate with it and integrate it because if you don't uh, it's a snake that then becomes a dragon and it might eat you so this uh, overview got 161 upvotes by now one day and i'm um, happy about that and it created a, a nice discussion so i wanted to go through it a bit so gas sua said pretty awesome for v visual learners like myself cool thanks for letting me know do you have any others to be honest i haven't pursued this visual aspect much but i see the value in it actually it is when i made this graph that i thought actually this might be quite interesting for um, or, or a good thing to put on reddit because people appreciate it less if you link to something external um, and uh, a chart is just something you can embed there and then i guess link to the full article um, so i might do that again um, mainly i did it be to help myself right to visualize what it is that i want to actually write and talk about but i see that uh, the, the chart has a value on its own anyway i linked here to a few of my favorite articles that i wrote about which are all pretty visual in the sense that they are accompanied by visual stuff um i, I want to go quickly through this one because um i'm quite proud of it so this is an article in which i try to explain um I guess my worldview or w what I understand to be the Jungian and perhaps the Petersonian worldview, you know, like how do you get from a like naive or how do you get from a naive worldview to a sophisticated worldview that kind of admits of this mythical uh, or, or psychological gods in a sense. So let's, let's look at it. So this is you in the world and this is, how you think about the world and then you you think of people who think up supernaturally and perhaps there are people who think that way that the, there is some kind of supernatural world behind it that influences the natural world but then uh, um oh yeah let's see okay this is additionally you have thoughts, feelings and impulses because that's also part of your world, right? Uh, it was not described before. But now this is a, a point that I make, which is um, what you see in the world, this stuff is not exactly the world because uh, you, you see, for example, illusions and, and, and things like that. So the tree that you see is not exactly the tree that is out there. Um, and this would be a proof of that. And so in reality, what you have is that all the things that you experience are also inside of your head together with your thoughts feelings and impulses and then there is a world out there the world in itself which is made out of kind of it's made out of science all the things that um, phys physicists have discovered and 
The next step is to say, okay, but that too is a model of the world. It's basically a set of thoughts about the world. It's it's a set of, in a sense, if if you really think about it, it's a set of correlations of these things here. So the tree, the stone, (laughs) the sun that appear in your consciousness behave in a certain way that can be best described and predicted through this model. But all these things don't tell you exactly what the world in itself looks like or what, what, it, what its true structure is. Um, in the sense that all of this could be a dream that is structured by this model, but then the dream could be embedded in some kind of simulation or com- huge computer. In a sense, everything that you can know about is how... Um, how the the, the phenomena of the world have behaved in the past and based on which or and which model describes them best. Okay, so let's this is a simplified view. So this is everything that appears in consciousness. This is basically your world. And you have to assume that there is some kind of world out there that is at the basis of your world um, reality, basically. And the only way you can get to know this or um, yeah, I, I guess is to try to draw correlations between the things that appear within your consciousness because you can never reach outside of your consciousness. So let's look at the consciousness as a thing, which is basically, this is your world, right? Um, The things that appear in your consciousness, the tree, the things that you see, but also your inner world, your properly inner world, your thoughts, feelings and impulses. So, um, okay, and this is, the Jungian point, I would say, it's that um, if this is the world of consciousness, nothing prevents it from being all mixed up, you know, like the tree and the thought and the an impulse and so on can all be mixed up because they are all part of this one unique field of consciousness. And um, the sorting out of these categories, this is something only recent. And so if you think about uh, primitive people, they projected their thoughts onto the things around them. So if you see the sun, the sun has thoughts, which now we would say, think, no, it's our thoughts about the sun. But they are still all appearances in your consciousness. And um, the whole, um, yeah, this, this is the idea of, uh, of the primitive mind or the archaic mind, to be more fair, um, we, where everything is imbued with personality, everything is imbued with meaning. And in a sense, we, by separating the thoughts, the feelings, the impulses from the phenomena, even though they are still part of our consciousness, so this separation is to a certain degree um, arbitrary. It's not really arbitrary, but um, it's not as warranted as we think because this is still part of our consciousness. So it, it might actually still have something that it belongs more to us than to the actual thing out there. So this, this separation, in a sense, has removed the meaning from the phenomena. So here the world was full of meaning and in our life, the world is empty of meaning because we, we extracted it, we separated it. In our consciousness, they are kind of split. So still, if you kind of think about the world, how it appears to you, it still has that quality. If you, if you are not kind of blind to it, um, a path in front of you, of you still tells you silently to follow it. Um, and like a landscape still is a promise of happiness. And, and so this is kind of how the world can be imbued with meaning. And then the final point is this. Um, oh, just a second. OK, I posted this a year ago, so I don't remember exactly what is in it. Um, I would go one step beyond that or even two. Let's say I would go two steps beyond this. One then is the idea that um, this world of meaning has a certain structure and that um, 
unconsciously or that if you explore, if you go into the depth of that structure, you will discover a kind of a source of all the meaning. And that's something that can be done either through active imagination or through probably psychedelics. So there is a kind of a psychological source of meaning where, where from which all meaning emerges. And this is kind of our psychological God, basically. And the next step would be to say that since we, everything we have is our consciousness and since everything we have is our psychology, um, our, our God that we can discover psychologically is indistinguishable from an actual God because we will never be able to jump out of our psychology. So if you have a fixed point from which all value emerges psychologically, but you can never step out of your psychology, then that fixed point is to you as if it was an actual real fixed point out there because you can never jump out of it. And I think this is a really hard point to get if you don't assume that it is something that is mostly unconscious. So you can in your conscious daily life <coughs> actually assume that there is nothing like that. And this is the debate about atheists still being uh, Christian and, and, and all that. But anyway, sorry, I went a bit deep into this, but um, I, I find it fascinating because uh, it, it is, in my opinion, a way uh, that we can use to kind of go from this um, I guess naturalistic worldview to this more psychological where the psychology is more primary worldview or at least a way to explain the, the difference to people who don't seem to get get it anyway uh, let's let's see a few more comments anyway th th we had a, a little I, I wrote about this point of the fixed point that is imagine there is, there is an easier way to th think about it. So just perspective, if you have a point that is just in front of you um, and so since the, the 3D world is projected onto your eyes, a point that is one centimeter from your eye is indistinguishable from a point that is all the way in the infinity uh, because it's, it's the same it appears the same to you and so if, if God is just psychological or it's down there in infinity you cannot see the difference unless you can step out of your perspective which you can't so that that's another way to put my argument about the psychological God being indistinguishable from an actual God okay um, we've had a few discussions about a few arguments here about these not being helpful or um, people not agreeing that meaning and uh, th th that was someone else's comment uh, that they don't really feel like meaning is or all this this whole talk about meaning is meaningful to them uh, let, let's see what i can talk about Okay, that, that's that's a funny one. Um, as as you see in this chart, all down in the negative side, there is this whole idea of um, totalitarian utopias, and then in the positive side, there is paradise on earth, and it seems contradictory, right? Like we want paradise on earth, but we don't want utopia, and this is something that someone pointed out, and I think here the point is clear. Uh, it's clear to me. Um, there is a clear difference or a, or a very important difference, which is that paradise on earth uh, is not something that you can define. It's not something that we can put the smartest people together and then define, okay, this is paradise on earth. We work a lot together to put, put it uh, in place and then it's done. Um, because that's how I understand the utopia, right? It's a system, a social system that is totally defined. Um, in all its details, this is how human beings work together in a good way. Let's put it in place and, and then it will work. The problem with this is if you believe in it, then everything that doesn't fit 
um, has to be eliminated or killed or, or, and so on. And it's actually what happened in the past. Um, and Paradise on Earth is actually something that emerges through the individual action of people that are trying to follow their inner sense of meaning. And this inner sense of meaning is not something rational. I mean, you have to use rationality, right? To mainly to integrate all the meanings that appear. Um, an example would be, right, uh, the inner meaning of I want to be fit appears. So you <clears throat> plan to wake up every morning and go and, and go jogging. And then in the morning, another meaning appears, which is I want to go back to sleep. And um, if you don't integrate these two meanings, all you do is just acting contradictory, right? In the, in the evening, you tell yourself to wake up. In the morning, you tell yourself <laughs> to go fuck yourself. So, and, and so you have to kind of integrate those meanings into something that has a hierarchy. Um, but then even that system will not be fair perfect. You have to add and add and add. And so that's why you have to pay attention to the thing that doesn't fit your model. And, and the more people do this and the more they act to build this proper order, but still pay attention to the exception to the snake in the in Eden, um, to the anomaly, this would be maps of meaning language. Uh, to that degree, we will build this paradise on Earth which is something that we will never be done with. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Um, Kinetic Capybara commented on there being too many religious words. <laughs> and I, I still have to get used to internet criticisms, let's call it. Um, because, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm still getting started and there will be more to come. But um, I had to think about this a bit, um, like how I'm, am I going to react to this at all, if, if at all. And because it was irritating to me to think like, so what is the problem? Is it that I put too many religious words in, in my summary? Because you can hardly read the chapter and describe it in without using religious words, because I mean, they, perhaps it's the most religious. It's not the most religious because I mean, I understand all of this in a psychological way, first and foremost. And then there is that point that I made before about the psychological God being indistinguishable from an actual God. But even if we take that aside, um, which I, I, it's not a strong belief, it's just that's the way I see it right now. Um, all this religious language still has a symbolic meaning and a metaphoric meaning. And I guess that's what's so powerful about this Jungian perspective that you can harness all that religious language um, and the deep meaning and the deep, you know, like meaning is implication for action. Um, at least that's what uh, the definition in Maps of Meaning is. And so if you align yourself with meaning, you will be strongly motivated. You know, these deep feelings um, are strong motivators. That's why people fight for religions. And, and if we can kind of harness this um, and live according to the meaning that expresses itself, then we will be strongly, strongly motivated. You know, like you, uh, <laughs> I mean, Peterson, but yeah, uh, it's also a character trait that he has, but um, waking up with a mission, you know, that kind of thing and uh, not being split and contradicted. And the more meaning you have, the more this religious language starts making sense to describe, you know, the, 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 um, the more, you, for example, the more you don't have separate things going on in your life, but the more they are kind of integrated, the more this kind of description of meaning as a mandala makes sense. And this is my logo that I use everywhere. Um, because the mandala is a, is a perfect for me intuitively. I'm a very visual person, right? So uh, this vision of like a center from which all meaning er emerges, but also, you know, this uh, positive order, this harmonious order. To me, it makes absolute sense. And uh, so, so even the symbol itself becomes very meaningful. And 
And it's almost unavoidable, uh, unavoidably religious, that, or at least sp spiritual, uh, the language. And so I guess it also has a bit to do with the personality that you have, or maybe the, the, the place you are in life. Because, for example, I, I have had my, my few years of um, fundamental skepticism, and I still, I guess, they're just layers of personality. There is still that part of me that um, reacts with skepticism towards, I don't know, just someone who is a pure believer. Um, but now I can appreciate this kind of more psychological talk, let's say. And in a sense, the fact that this is um, deeply motivating to me <laughs> is a s certain kind of proof that this kind of language is maps onto something within me. So maybe it's not proof, but it certainly speaks to a, a certain kind of usefulness of this kind of language. So anyway, um, so uh, I guess that's, that's it. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about the reactions that I got to this, um, to this argument map. And I wanted to say thank you for the people. Uh, thank you to you for engaging. I find this topic fascinating and I'm really trying to get to the core of, of the argument. And to me right now, as if I had to summarize my understanding of what it means to live with meaning is uh, there are like three states, ma main categorical states in which you can be in meaning wise, you know, like and meaning I see as the shape of the present moment. So the first shape would be the desert, meaning like it's a, basically a lack of meaning or a vacuum of meaning in which what you have, or, or it's also the underworld and you have to go deep and pay attention and, and because it's not empty of meaning, it's just like, it's hard to detect it and you have to start aim low and start with cleaning your room, right? You know, like that, that small stuff. And then as you get moving, maybe like you have kind of big, big chunks, contradictory chunks of meaning, right? Like the person who wants to plan and the person who wants to enjoy life and and they have to kind of find an accord. So, and there too, like you have like, you, you need to integrate these things. Otherwise you have like two horses pulling in different directions. And the more you integrate them, the more you create this kind of mandala, which is this, in a sense, because we are very visual pe um, animals, basically, right? We, we, we have, our eye is shaped like a target. If you want that, like there is a center, which is where the most focus is. And then everything else is organized around that center. So if you like, if you are hunting, you look at the thing and everything organizes itself around that thing that you're hunting. And so in a sense, this mandala is also a representation or I, I probably it emerges from this, the, the visual organization of our visual system. So, um, the more you integrate everything you do, the more your life starts taking that shape of everything organized around one principle. But then that's the interesting thing. Um, you can never be, it can never be perfect. So what emerges is that this, um, what Peterson talked about is the snitch, which is like the emerging chaos. <clears throat> so imagine that everything around you um, is organized in your, like you have a story that describes everything and takes everything into account, but then, then it's not perfect. So somewhere, the seams break a bit and then chaos emerges as this little, I guess, this little snake or, or, or the anomaly, basically, which is a, a hole, a wormhole into chaos, the things that you haven't described yet or integrated. So, and then here you have two options. You can either ignore it and ignoring it won't make it disappear, but it will make it grow bigger. Um, it, the, the snake will become a dragon over time and maybe eat you. Um, the alternative is that you look at it and you describe it carefully, truthfully, and by describing it, you like you breathe structure into it basically, and the structure then um, merges into the seams of this greater order that you are creating. So, and and then maybe the last uh, state is when I guess no anomaly is bothering you for a while, and and you are just 
active according to this meaning that you have created over time or that you have discovered, I would say is the more accurate um, description. And you are basically meaningfully engaged in, in what you're doing. And so this is my best psychological model of the core of the core uh, of Peterson's teachings. Uh, it's, a, it's a dialogue that I would like to have with you. So let me know what you think. I hope uh, you appreciate it. Have a nice day.